In a previous Krakatoa MX 2.5 introduction video, we saw how a PRT source could be used to create a live clone of a particle flow system and apply deformations, uh, magma modifiers, and so on. However, uh, the PRT source can be used on any valid uh, particle source in Krakatoa, and since a mesh with its vertices is also considered a valid particle source, we can actually create a PRT source out of this geosphere and uh, we get one particle per vertex. If we select this geosphere and change the number of vertices by increasing the number of segments, obviously our uh, particles will also follow and we can add uh, an animated noise modifier, for example, uh, set the frequency to probably 0 0.05 and give it a strength of 10 by 10 by 10 fractal and probably a scale of about 50 and now if we go and uh, switch this uh, geosphere to bounding box we're going to see only the particles and they are following the animation of the vertices now if we wanted to render each one of those particles as multiple particles we have the Krakatoa cloner it has been around for a few releases already and uh, Right now we're showing 10% of all the uh, possible particles in the viewport. And the radius here, if I reduce it, we're going to see that each particle is actually replaced with uh, a bunch of particles, 100 particles distributed in a sphere. Uh, if we zoom a little bit closer, we can also take a look at the repopulation, where uh, instead of creating spheres that can intersect, we are creating a voxel grid and then repopulating in a spherical radius. So this is the radius, and if I go down, we're once again going to see the individual spheres around. But when they merge together, they actually are going to create a continuous volume, just like uh, filling a level set from the PRT volume with particles. But there is also a third option, the use clone list, and that's uh, kind of cool because we can take any other particle system and replace each particle with uh, a full copy of that second particle system. So in our case, let's go and create a cone, for example, uh, give it a height of 20, and actually we're going to set the first radius to 0 and the second one to about 0 0.5. This gives us an inverted cone, and I'm going to use a PAT surface and distribute, let's say, 1000 particles on its surface. Now, if I pick the PRT source and uh, pick that second PRT source as uh, the clone list uh, element, each one of the particles is going to be replaced with one copy, and of course they are going to follow the motion. However, we would like to also probably orient them along the normals, and right now we don't have any orientation information, so we could go underneath the PRT cloner and add a magma modifier, and this magma modifier can define uh, an orientation channel so we can find the orientation on the list of channels and we are going to connect the normal to it but that's not enough because the orientation is a quaternion and the normal is just a vector we need three vectors to create the x y and z axis we use the normal as the z and we're going to connect it actually uh, convert to quaternion I'll swap the inputs, I'll also connect to the first input, I'll reorder automatically, and then this first input I will insert here a cross product with uh, an up vector, 0, 0, 001, and this cross product will have to be normalized, so I'll do vec vector normalize, Vn, and the normal is already normalized anyway. Uh, we'll connect this normalized x vector also into the y, and then introduce another cross uh, product here with the normal. However, we want the normal to be the first input and the y axis to be the second input, and then we'll normalize this also, Vn. And now, if we enable the auto update, each one of our clones will be oriented along the normal. And of course, since the normals are also changing when the vertices are moving around, we're getting a little bit of noise while the uh, following the animation. We can go and uh, assign Krikato as the current renderer with default settings. And we can try to render this uh, point cloud. 
I'm going to enable the false additive mode. I'll switch to iterative mode because uh, this is going to uh, allow me to render any frame without uh, caring about the uh, frame range. And um, I can keep probably the density settings as they are, but if I hit uh, the render button, quite possibly we're not going to get what we expect. We only get the particles of the original cone and we don't get anything of the distribution. And the reason for this is, by default, the option to compensate density is checked. That means that when we add 1000 more particles to replace this single particle, each one of those particles is getting only 1000th of the original density, and that just gets invisible. So we can uncheck this option, and if we render now, then uh, we are going to get our particles rendered. Obviously, the density is very high, so we can go one order of magnitude down and uh, try again, and this is looking a little bit better, but it would look even better if we would override it to some uh, better color. For example, we can enable color override here and set some uh, bluish color, because blue has red, green, and blue that tend to combine to white when they uh, rendered in um, false additive mode. And of course, we can go five times less dense uh, in order to get a um, slightly more transparent result. But right now, we are using only a static particle system, just a PT surface. Of course, we could animate the underlying cone or animate the particles themselves with some uh, deformation modifiers and magma and so on. But why not use a live particle system instead? And we can create one of the simpler ones. We can go to the particle systems uh, category and get a super spray. And the super spray can create a very similar uh, result to the cone that we are uh, using here. I'm going to select this system and r actually remove the cone that we were cloning in order to speed up things and see the particles easier here. Right now we are emitting too few particles, so I'll create something like 300 particles. Uh, we'll change the speed to 2 and uh, we'll stop emitting on 100, so for the whole uh, duration we're going to have particles. We'll be um, letting them live for about 20 frames plus minus 10, so after they move up as a single ray, eventually they will start dying, but uh, randomly, so we're getting less and less particles here. We cannot pick this super spray directly as a clone element, but we can pick it as a PT source. So we'll create a PT source out of the spray. And then in this system here, we'll pick the PT uh, source that we just created. And we can try to render this. Let's take a look. Right now we are emitting the particles along a straight line, and that of course gives us a big low. And we see also the original particles in the background, so it's a good idea to actually hide them. If we select the PT source, we can uh, go and say don't render the source object. So this will hide the legacy particle system. And I'll also uncheck the renderable of the this source itself. And I think we could go down to, let's say, to uh, times 10 to the power of minus 3 and see if th we like the result better. This is kind of neat, but I think 5 would be even better. And in order to speed things up, I'll disable the history and saving kind of images, so when it finishes rendering uh, the image, it returns a little bit faster. I think this is fairly good already as a, a glowing star, and of course all those rays will be first dynamically moving out and then also animating as the underlying particles are moving. But the particle system, of course, has a lot of animatable settings that we can use. For example, we can uh, change the spread, and this will give us a result very similar to the cone that we had before. So if we render with an uh, angle of 5 degrees, of course our rays will uh, look more like the cones that we had before, but they're also falling off because more and more particles are dying in that area. And as I mentioned, this is animatable, so we could go and set keyframes for this. So I can set it to zero uh, and go to frame, uh, let's say, 20 and go up to, let's say, spread of 10. And then copy that key back 
10 frames later we'll return back to a straight race and we can move all this to start around frame 30 so in the beginning we're going to emit the particles there will be straight race then they're going to send a wave up where we see here as the angle is changing and uh, eventually they will turn back to being straight race and there are also other parameters here that we could animate there is an off-plane parameter that we can uh, change and there is also the, sp the spread angle that should probably be 180 so whenever we are in the uh, position of uh, increased spread here we are not creating just a, a plane but we're creating a cone and um, if we change the off axis this is also creating a kind of neat uh, effect where all of them are being turned sideways and this creates a glowing ball uh, so we could go to the last frame and probably animate this go to let's say I don't know 90 degrees probably let's try 90 degrees here and then grab this key that was in the beginning and move it over so this animation will happen around frame 80 to 100 so our straight particles will start turning to the side and actually uh, creating a big uh, blob and potentially we could go further in time or just shift this one a little bit earlier so it has time to propagate uh, and that will give us uh, frame 100 that looks more like this let's take a look what frame 100 looks like yeah that looks kind of neat so uh, let's go and start some rendering with this I'll disable the iterative mode I'll uh, set the active segment to 0 to 100 and um, find somewhere here a folder where I can write a version 005 of my test and I'm going to call this test.exr and then I'll hit render and wait for it to finish and when it finishes uh, we are going to return and take a look at the animation so now that the rendering is done we can right click the render button and go to open rendered frame and select the last option uh, open a sequence in RAM player channel A when we do this an IFL file will be created automatically and uh, the sequence will be loaded now we can play back and take a look what we created we have our spiky particles which then uh, go into a more diffuse form uh, shortly and then against the end uh, we had the off-axis uh, animation so this is a kind of a neat effect and of course the uh, super spray has a lot of other options that we can explore and add bubble motion and so on and uh, see what our uh, creation would do when rendered but another thing that we could try is uh, try to vary the color along the ray and of course that would be relatively easy with the gradient however there are two ways to do this and one way would be to add a magma to the actual clone object that means the PT source with the PT clone on top if we take a look at its uh, particle data viewer results we're going to see that we have age and lifespan channels we have position velocity scale color and then source position source velocity source normal and so on and these source channels are the actual channels that were on the original PT source at the bottom and the channels that we see in the beginning are the copied channels that are coming from the distribution object so if we are creating 15 million particles it would make no sense even though we have the age and lifespan adding a magma to this object and calculating for 15 million particles what the color should be would be a waste of time when we can calculate it for only 600 or whatever the number is at any of those frames around 600 so we can select this source not the uh, super spray but the actual PT source underneath and we can add the magma to it so if I add the magma modifier here I actually have exactly the same channels if we take a look at the particle data viewer for this source we also have the age and lifespan and everything minus those source channels that we saw before so age and lifespan are exactly what we need in order to create a gradient over the lifetime of the particles so we'll be setting the color 
We shouldn't forget to disable the overwrite of the color because we were setting for the whole scene the blue color, but we want now to have per particle color here. And here we can say Shift A for age divided by Shift L for lifespan. This gives us 0 to 1 result already. And we'll convert this one, or we'll say CV for convert to vector. And this will be used as a UV coordinate into an input texture. So I'll create an input texture uh, and we'll enable the texture cards. We'll connect this one as the input for the texture coordinate. So the U coordinate will be changing from 0 to 1 as the age goes from 0 to end of uh, lifespan. And uh, the uh, input texture will have to be picked to be some gradient or gradient ramp. And that will bring out the color. So we go and pick a gradient ramp. We'll put this gradient ramp into the material editor. And in the material editor, which is hiding now behind here. I'm going to change the um, color in the beginning. We can go again with something that is kind of bluish and nice. And then in the middle, or a little bit slightly after the middle, we can go and give it some more greenish color. And then in the end, we can go and give it some um, yellow orange shade. Let's say that this is the gradient that we want to create. And if we update here, and actually if we hit out of date, now the colors will be distributed on this system and we'll have to move the time slider. And we see that as the particles are getting older, they are going from blue to green to orange. So uh, let's try to render a frame of this and see if we like it. We'll enable again the iterative mode so we don't overwrite any frames of the frame range. Uh, hit the render button and take a look on frame 33. What does it look like? That looks kind of neat. Uh, we can, of course, uh, tweak the values further, but in general, uh, the results will be similar to what we saw before, plus the added gradient on top. 